The GB News Tavern is well and truly declared open, and I'm joined on Talking Pints by Sir Christopher Meyer. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. Cheers. Cheers. Very good to see you. But you've never done this on TV before, have you? Never. No, never. never. I've a drop of alcohol has never passed by <laughs> on TV. Well, I was going to come on to that subject because, you know, as a diplomat, I know you served in Brussels and you did some time in Moscow and goodness knows where else you went. But the job you finished up with, five and a half years in Washington, D.C., as our, as our man, our ambassador to the United States of America. I mean, that must have been the dream job for a diplomat. It was the dream job yeah. for a diplomat because you, you had this sense that you were in the world's only superpower, as it was at that time, to mm. be perfectly yeah. frank. Yeah. It was the summit in many different ways of any diplomat's career and I had uh, two presidents on my watch. I had Bill Clinton and his uh, second administration, and I had the first bit of George W. Bush. And from the moment arrived, when I arrived, somebody said to me, it's going to be terribly boring, you know. It's going to be very, very boring because the economy is going very, very well. Yep. And then Monica Lewinsky exploded on the scene, if I can put it like that. And from then on, it was non-stop action from, from you know, excitement to tragedy you name it, 9-11, all yep. that stuff. Yes, and wars. And wars, and uh, several wars. And finally, uh, I left just before the war in Iraq began. So it, it was all action all yeah. of the time. Yeah, and of course the Afghanistan decision. And Iraq was building, wasn't it? I mean, at the time you left, was it obvious to you that Iraq was going to happen? Uh, it, 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 I'm one of those who think that George W. Bush took the decision to go into Iraq pretty late. But this was not something that he had finally decided very early on. For example, there's a, there's a school of thought that says that when Tony Blair and George W. met at George W.'s ranch in, mm, I in April of 2003. Yo, yo Blair. Yeah. <laughs> you, get, oh, you get all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, Bush was full of that kind of stuff. You know, He said uh, Putin was one cold dude. <laughs> 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 You know, cold dude, absolutely right. And then he made a mistake by saying, I looked into Putin's heart and I saw this was somebody I could do business with or mm. something like that. He changed his mind, of course. Well, we'll come to, but no, we will come to Putin, I promise you. But you're there through all that drama, but you're living in splendour. You've, yeah. you've got a magnificent wine cellar. Your job is to entertain for the country. Well, hang on. Hang on, <laughs> hang on a minute. I mean, people, some people think all I did was dish out Ferrero Rocher on Milad Abitaz uh, to, to people who came, came, came to receptions. And, of course, when they came to the British Embassy, mm. it did represent the United Kingdom. Quite. And it represented the monarchy. Because I don't get my commission as a... I didn't get my commission yeah. as a diplomat from the government. I got it from Her Majesty the Queen. So you had to live up to this. And, of course, the Americans... You know America better than I do. They love it. Fact. They love they it. They just love that. And you had to have it yeah. as they would expect it to be. And so we tried to be modern and informal... But at the same time, not let them forget that this was yeah. an outpost of Her Majesty's Yeah, well, it's a job I wasn't going to get, even though... Um, no, you would have done it very well, even, I think. Well, even though the 45th president did send a tweet out <laughs> late one know. night... That's a notorious <laughs> moment. <laughs> <laughs> ...suggesting that I no, should... No. I, of course, had it been offered, would have done it happily and gleefully, and I, yeah. I suspect I might have done better with the 45th president, um, but in the end, we did. Um, but that's, by the by, that's history. Yeah. But it is interesting, I mean... Did you feel Clinton and Bush had a strong affinity to the UK or not especially? I mean, how did they view us? I thought Clinton had a very cold eye to him. More so, actually, than Hillary. Hillary has the reputation of being a bit robotic. Mm -hmm. But in private, it was, it was Clinton who frequently went into kind of a cold uh, a mood where he wouldn't, he wouldn't say, say anything. What he did have, though, and what we had with Clinton, was a very good relationship between Tony Blair and Bill Clinton. Yes. Clinton, I think, had no particular sympathy for the United Kingdom, although he was a Rhodes Scholar and he had attended Oxford. So he could have created a loving relationship with us. I don't think he did, because I don't think he was that kind of man, to be quite honest with you. But he and Blair, and Blair played this very well. I've got, I, I have to take my hat off to him. Did create a political and personal relationship that was very, very strong and served us in the UK very well. Yeah. 
Now, the 45th president, Donald Trump, who I mentioned, of course, without doubt the most pro-United Kingdom president has been for a long, long time. I mean, huge admirer of the Queen and, of course, yeah. the Scottish ancestry from his mother and all the rest of it. If he was in the White House today, would Putin have invaded Ukraine? Well, the answer to that is, because I don't understand Trump as much as you do, if I can put it like that, it either would have been an incentive to invade or it would have been a deterrent to invade, and I don't know which of those two things is, is right. In a sense, the unpredictability is what may have scared Putin. It might, it, it might have scared Putin. And one of the things I hold against Joe Biden, I think, is has not been a good move for, for American diplomacy, is to make it so clear from the very outset, there was no question of NATO boots on the ground. Um, I think no NATO boots on the ground is probably right. But I think Biden could have left a kind of cloud of ambiguity hanging mm. over this, too, so that it, it makes Putin's calculation, therefore, much harder to arrive at. And as the leader of the Western world and the strongest partner in the NATO alliance by country mile, I've been astonished that we haven't seen Biden over here in Europe. He's coming tomorrow. Yeah, he's coming now, isn't he? But, but, I mean, I would have thought three weeks ago there should have been a sort of get-together at NATO HQ. I mean, there isn't much leadership coming, is there? I, 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 when somebody said to me several years ago, well, Biden's running for the, for, for the presidency uh, of, uh, you know, against Trump in his first term, um, <coughs> my immediate reaction is too old. Yeah. I knew Trump, sorry, I knew Biden in Washington when he was at, at his peak of his powers. He was a very, very effective congressional Senate politician. Brilliant. Um, and he declined after that. You could see it happening while he was vice president uh, to Obama. And we've seen it, I think, ever since, he's, even since the inauguration. That he's... That he, he, it's quite he, embarrassing watching it somehow. I, I actually think he's, um, he, he's too old yeah. for the job. And I think this has constrained the kinds of things that he can do. And unfortunately, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, and uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, yeah, they can replace him, but they don't have the charisma or the personality that some of their predecessors used to have. And Kamala Harris, the Vice President... And that hasn't worked very well either, has it? It hasn't worked well. It hasn't worked well. And I was surprised he appointed her, actually. And you've got Trump, who's 75, and you've got talk of Hillary Clinton perhaps wanting to run again. And it's astonishing, isn't it? No, I can't really say this, because, Nigel, you're a mere child compared with me. <laughs> but I mean, as a septuagenarian, you know, you can't, you can't run the Western world on septuagenarian, septuagenarian yeah, if I pronounce yeah, that right. Yeah, yeah. So if Trump runs in 2024, he's going to be how much? 70... He'd be 78. Yeah, yeah exactly. You can't do that. You well, can't. It's, yeah, it certainly hasn't worked in Biden's favour. Um, and where are we with, I mean, where are we with it? this man Putin? I mean, I, I have to tell you, I always thought this was a cold, hard, calculating individual. I never liked him as a human being, but I thought he was a clever operator, a clever player yeah. of the Russian yeah. national interest. And, and, and now I sort of wonder to myself, is this a symptom of somebody who's been in an ivory tower for 22 years, has lost touch with reality? Is he, I mean, what, what's going on in your view? When I, I was posted to Moscow twice, I went there in the late 60s and I went there again in the mid-80s. And the guys I met who were avowed KGB yep. were always the more interesting, the more intelligent, the more sophisticated. So the fact that he'd had a KGB background before he became president of Russia, initially I thought to myself, well, at least we cut to the chase here. We've got the guys who really know what's what. But I think what has overwhelmed that and overwhelmed his reputation as being a cunning, strategic, yeah. more tactical, mm. chess-playing guy, is the huge sense of humiliation and grievance he carries inside himself, as do the people immediately around him. This is Mo for the loss of their empire, effectively. Yeah, I mean, you could. how far do you go back? It, it, I knew Russians who were enraged that we didn't give them sufficient credit for Stalin's role in the Second World War, mm. what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War. Yeah. Then you have the collapse of the Soviet Union and your country disappears. And you are a lieutenant colonel in the KGB mm. sitting in Dresden mm. and you see Eastern Germany, the old East German Republic, handed back to the Federal Republic of Germany and it is the greatest humiliation you have ever endured. And then I think in our moment of triumph when communism collapsed in 1991, uh, we didn't handle it very well. 
and Henry Kissinger, whom I worship at the feet of Henry yeah. Kissinger, and George Kennan, who invented, a uh, veteran American diplomat who invented the idea of containment, said move, expanding NATO eastwards oh. was a massive blunder. Uh, and oh. there were other ways of maintaining and preserving the security of Central I felt Europe. this for 30 years. And when we saw the revolution in 2014 in Ukraine, you know, I remember saying to the European Parliament, you know, we're, we're, with the expansion of NATO and the European Union, we're, you know, we're playing into Russian paranoia. And I've been called a Putin supporter for daring to say. Yeah, well, you are. Well, I mean, I'm being called a Putin supporter for daring to say. Oh, really? Yeah, no, so he's... Yeah. So, so how does this end? Because we have to actually give Putin a way out, don't we? Well, I'm not sure we need to give Putin a way out. I would give Russia a way out. OK. Uh, and I... I, I yeah, that, that is the key question, Nigel. Yeah. How does this end? Ooh. And... Uh, I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't a clue, but what it, the steps it needs to go through is some kind of ceasefire slash truce slash arrangement between Zelensky, uh -huh. Ukrainian president, yep. and Putin. And then maybe the rest of us, Americans, NATO, can, can build on that to come up with some uh, pan-European solution which would be based on arms control. So you wouldn't have to talk about neutrality or Finlandization, which the Ukrainians yeah. hate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the thing that is most dangerous, most dangerous right now, is that people say to me, is this a new Cold War? And I say to them, I wish it was. Because the Cold War, as we remember it, was full of rules, yeah. regulations, ways yeah. of doing business, arms control treaty. It's a regulated crisis. I know we don't know where we are. And now we have no I clue. Agree. No, I agree. A clue. I agree. Now, as a foreign office man, are you still in mourning over Brexit? No. Well, no. Let me t I, let, may, may I put this on the record. <laughs> I voted Remain. Yeah. But I never believed in ever closer union. I took a pragmatic decision. To leave is going to be so difficult, so complicated, it's going to involve such, about to use another rude word, difficult negotiation, better to stay inside and try to reform it from within in the way that Margaret Thatcher succeeded in doing. John Major did quite well over the Maastricht negotiations. David Cameron made a complete big zero of the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and that was the way to go. But once the decision had been taken, yeah. we had a moral and political obligation to respect it yes. and implement it. And we went through three and a half years of absolute agony, didn't we? Yeah, well, then I became... But the thing that then interested me most of all was the negotiation. How were we going to negotiate our withdrawal? Mm. And talking of pig's ears, that was another one. Yes, I mean, I, it, it was awful. But, of course, all of this, or much of this, we form our opinions, ordinary folk, going about their lives, you know, bringing up their families, doing their jobs. <clears throat> they form their opinions through the press. They form it through what they read in the newspapers, what they see on the telly. And now, of course, the whole dimension of social media. And I'm just interested to get your take. You know, there you were, boss of the Press Complaints Commission, <laughs> during a period in which, let's be frank, a lot of British newspapers behaved abominably. No, they, they did behave badly. You know. You know, and we got Leveson. I, I wonder, perhaps we've now got the right relationship between public figures and the press. What do you think? Well, I thought the Press Complaints Commission... I mean, I chaired it for, for, for six years, yeah. and it had loads of things wrong with it. There was loads of stuff that I wanted to do to make it more effective and uh, to make regulation tighter. Uh, but the one thing I did not believe in, and this is the direction in which Leveson was moving, mm. was in state regulation yeah. of the media. And, of course, already, what year am I talking about now? I mean, we were already in the 90s. Um, 1990s. Um, am I, have I got that right? No, we were in the, we were in the 2000s. Yeah, two, oh, 2000, 2000. This beer is just getting... <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what I would say to you was that already the media was changing rapidly. The internet was... was we didn't know... We, did, we didn't understand social media fully at yeah, the time. Yeah. And the notion that a state or a government can control any of that stuff is now for the birds. So Leveson has become almost automatically obsolete. Mm. And have we got the balance right? I, I, I just don't know. Mm. I just don't know. But we have 
And it's a jungle out there. It's, it, and it is. And it's the, a jungle out there. And social media, Nick Clegg, now one of the most powerful men in the world. Isn't and it extraordinary? Who would have believed it? <laughs> a final thought, Christopher. A final thought. Good old Nick. <laughs> well, good for him, you yeah. know. Do you remember? We agree with Nick. I know, I do. I do. <laughs> a final thought. How do you see the future of this country looking five, ten years ahead? Well, I'm always an optimist. And although I, I was the very first member of my family, as far as I know, to join um, well, the, diplomatic service, the, the diplomatic service, the foreign office, one of the things that inspired me to do so was I was an, always an optimist about this country. I took a hit in my optimism, I have to say, in the early 70s when I returned from Spain right into the three-day week. Oh. And I thought, Jesus, you know, what is this? Yeah. And at that moment, I thought, it's the European community, as it was then called, that will save us. Yes, and many did. Uh, yeah. and, that, and that was yeah. my motivation yeah. for supporting our entry uh, yeah. into, uh, into the European community. But I worry about... I don't worry so much about Britain, because I think we have a spirit and a will here which takes us through most things. I worry about the world. And if we go back to Putin and Ukraine and all that, mm. there is a way it could end, which is in a nuclear conflict. Mm. It's all enough to drive you to drink, really, isn't it? Yeah, I've always tried to resist it. <laughs> but tonight I gave up. So, Christopher Meyer, thank you for joining Cheers. me on Talking Parts. Thank you. Thank you.